Hi everybody, um, I'm in Boston, still part of the um, Better Reading Live in New York. Well, not exactly, because we are in Boston. But we're actually um, in Sebastian Spee's study, uh, and we're talking to him about his new book, The Art of Rivalry. Um, Sebastian has agreed to give me some time, very generously, thank you. Um, so firstly, can you tell me about the book? Sure, Cheryl. Yeah, no, it's great to see you. Thanks for, for coming here. Um, the book, it's, as you say, it's called The Art of Rivalry, and it's about four relationships uh, in the modern art period. When I say modern, it's, it's sort of 1850 to 1950. So uh, it just tells the story of, of these relationships, uh, these artists at the, the sort of turning points in their career. So we've got Degas and Manet, we've got Matisse and Picasso, which is probably the most famous one. Um, and then we've got Lucien Freud and Francis Bacon and Willem de Kooning and Jackson Pollock. And, you know, I wanted to focus on the, the beginnings of the, re the relationship in each case because, you know, that's when everything was kind of wide open. You didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, these artists we all think of as great now, but they were breaking new ground. In, and I think it was hard for them to know if what they were doing was any good, you know. And it really meant a lot for them in each case to have one other person to not only affirm that what they were doing was of interest, but to kind of challenge them, threaten them, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, pull them out of themselves, if you like. Yeah. I mean, you've called the book The Art of Rivalry, but really it is about friendship, isn't it? It's, it's more about that. And it's more about how friendships influence your work and your life, don't you think? Oh, for sure, for sure. And I'm glad you could. I mean, I could have called it Frenemies, right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I almost wanted to, because um, it really is about that. And, and in a way, almost more about the friendship side. I mean, not all of in each, they weren't all close friends, uh, but, they were, but at these key points in their careers, the relationships in each case did get very close and uh, you know I, I, I got a, I was sort of moved as I learned about these stories um, at how kind of vulnerable each of them was and what a huge part the support of, of, of this other person uh, in their life uh, meant you know it, it, it played a huge role. I want to get back that, to that I want to talk yeah. about friendships and I want to talk about work but before that just give me a really brief overview firstly with Mat Matisse and Picasso I've got to say I, I initially didn't know that they crossed over so much I mean they're both I mean you know they're both great artists of course and Matisse is one of my favorites decorative as I think you once told me <laughs> um, but a little bit about their relationship yeah, well, it was it was key, and in fact, it, although Matisse was about 10, 12 years older than Picasso, uh, they knew each other from early on, and they kept kind of sparring all through their careers. But it was at this early period. It's interesting that you know they were both from out outside Paris, you know, the cosmopolitan centre where it was all happening. Matisse was from the north of France, Picasso obviously from Spain, um, and you know. To, what was interesting to me too is that all the people whose support they were competing for, the collectors like Gertrude Stein and Leo Stein, and the Russian guy, uh, Shukin, you know, they were also from outside. And it almost took an outsider to kind of see that what, what they were doing, which looked so crazy to the Parisians, was worth supporting and was genuinely interesting. Um, and I think, you know, they saw that in each other. So their, their friendship really mattered a lot in those early days. And Manet and Degas, again, I mean, that was quite an extraordinary friendship from what I read in the book. Yeah. Um, can I just put a personal note in? Degas is my favourite, favourite. Yeah, I love Degas. <laughs> well. Yeah, he's great. Uh, there's been nothing like him. Um, no, and there's since. a great show in Melbourne. I think, is it there still is. on? Yeah, uh, I think I, it is. It's yeah. one of the great Degas shows. Um, it's ever been put on anywhere. So, so really, that was, um, in a sense, that was more, uh, just as much a, a rivalry as it was a friendship, wasn't it? Yeah, very yeah. much. Um, but but it, it was, you know, most importantly, a friendship early on. And, and it got to the point where Degas painted Manet and his wife. Uh, yeah. So, you know, they were seeing each other almost every night. They were going to musical soirees at each other's homes and meeting in a particular cafe with a bunch of others once a week for quite a long period. And so they were very close. But it all went sort of horribly wrong when, when Degas painted this portrait of Manet and his wife. And for complicated reasons, you know, it went, it went awry and, and Manet slashed the painting mm. with a knife. Uh, and of course, naturally, that caused it. I really, I really want you to tell me more about that. But no, people have to go out and read <laughs> the book and read it. So we'll get on to, we'll, we'll talk about 
uh, Bacon and, and Freud. Yeah. Wow, that must have been, was that fiery? <laughs> it, it was, it was complex. Yeah, yeah. Complex. And, and in sort of ways that crossed over from artistic influence and into love life and, mm. and, and everything else. You know, because really they were both larger than life characters, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. And influenced by so much, not just art, but I guess there was a lot of outside factors that might have influenced their work. There really were, and, and so it was very volatile. Um, but again, Francis Bacon played such a key role in kind of opening Freud's way of working up, and, yeah. and not just his way of working and his style of painting, but, but kind of his whole attitude to the world. You know, Bacon was a gambler and, mm. and, and this lived a very sort of anarchic, crazy lifestyle. And I think, uh, I think Freud was hugely seduced by that. Yeah, and also it showed in Bacon's work, didn't it, so much? Oh, okay, yeah. and the the little known to me, I guess, is de Kooning and, and Jackson Pollock. Tell us a little bit about their relationship. Yeah, well, they're often thought... I mean, here in the States, they're, they're sort of the two biggest figures of, of, of modern art, in a way, because they, together with a few others, like Rothko and so on, helped form this movement, Abstract Expressionism. But again, you had a situation where de Kooning, whom everyone admired and who was a great draftsman, mm. Um, uh, was kind of a bit stuck and this is something this is a pattern that's in all of them in a way that one artist is a bit stuck and the other comes along and through their influence and their their approach to painting and to life they kind of suggest a whole bunch of new possibilities for uh, for the other and and that's what happened you know Pollock was this crazy you know wild living anarchic person uh, who who sort of made de Kooning think hey maybe I, I need to just loosen up a bit here and, and that's what he did and, yeah. and, and they both had this huge effect on each other. And where were you when we bought Blue Poles? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Blue Poles. Remember uh, how controversial that was? That was such a big thing, wasn't it? Yeah, I, know, and people I remember it. that it almost brought down the Whitlam government. Yeah. Um, yeah, but now people Look go, how there, art go to that gallery just to see that painting. You know? But it's <laughs> how <laughs> art influences yeah. influences society. You know, it's incredible. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, now let's talk a little bit about relationships, and I guess we can apply that to almost anything. We can apply that to being a painter, a photographer, um, even a writer. I mean, I see that a lot among m amongst writers, mm. and I'm not just talking about rivalry, but I'm, I mean, in a way that um, that one needs the other as well, but also too in how how the people around us um, kind of, you know, uh, make us who we are. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. You know, you, you fall under the spell of someone and, 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 and then it becomes a question of, okay, how much of their influence are you going to take on and mm -hmm. how much are you going to push back because you're in danger of losing your own identity. And it's funny, you know, I, I've just been reading you know, so much later than everyone else, I feel stupid, but the Elena Ferrante books. Uh, I've loved those books. They are so yes. great. You know, I'm, I'm only, I'm right near the end of the second volume, so I feel way behind everyone else. But I wish that I'd read it before I, I wrote this book, because it, there's a, a relationship between, obviously, the narrator and, and Leela that uh, is, is so similar to the, to the pattern I, I picked up in these artist relationships. Um, so I've been writing bits down and, you know, marking the page and, and uh, you know, as I read it, thinking, yes, she, she puts it so perfectly. I wish I really, you know, I would have been then sort of met with the, the, um, the challenge of how much to sort of quote her <laughs> or whatever. So in a way, it was probably a good idea. But, Do you but know, great. I've read those books and I've loved them. And I know uh, many of our readers, the better reading readers have loved them. But often people have asked the question of how did they maintain a friendship? I mean, I... Yeah. I, uh, there was a panel at the Sydney Writers' Festival only this year and they were talking to the translator and, uh, you know, why did they, you know, is it fictional that they still stayed friends? I don't think so. Oh. I think a healthy friendship is about that. It it's was, a, yeah, yeah you it, go. It was symbiotic, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, they, they needed each other and, and yes, they needed those periods where they, they pushed apart from one another. Um, but then they kind of realised, especially the narrator, because we're hearing it through her, but she, she's seeing the world and herself through the lens of, of Leela so much of the time. And even when they're apart, that, that, that's true. And I think, you know, when you think of Matisse and Picasso, there was a period there where Matisse, you know, really, I don't really write about this in the book, but, but he was under the spell of Picasso through the, the teens, you know, the First World yeah. War period. And then he needed to get away from him. And he went to Nice. He went to Nice. Yeah, he had wow. nothing to do with Picasso for a long period. And yet, and, and painted in a totally different style. 
Um, but I bet you he's still thought about him thought often. Every day, yeah. I'm so convinced. I yeah, really yeah. And, and I think that's the same in the Ferrante books. I'm, I'm just loving them for that reason. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I can't uh, recommend this book highly enough. It's called The Art of Rivalry by Sebastian Smee. Yes, it is about art, but gee, it's about friendship, it's about love, and it's about the people we have round us who actually make us who we are. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank, thank you. you so, thank you so much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me in your home. Oh, that's great. That's great um, and I know that we will enjoy this book very much. Well, our audience in Australia will enjoy it very much. Thank you. Thank you.